Uh, this, this training is one of several events in the framework of the Human Rights in Business project, uh, which my uh, colleague and coordinator of the project, uh, Katharina Janibas, will introduce to you uh, after um, my input. Uh, you see in, in today's program that um, we could gather a very diverse and experienced group of, of experts, representatives of, as has just been mentioned, NGOs, uh, the European Union, academics, lawyers, uh, judges, um, and I think the program will offer you insights uh, into judiciary and non-judicial uh, remedies um, that I, I think quite thought-provoking and, and will bring us further down the road uh, on this very topical issue. Uh, at this point, I would also very much like to thank uh, the team at the Boltzmann Institute of Human Rights. Without them, this day would not be possible. Uh, it's in particular Katharina Häusler, who is taking photos right now, so she's always around uh, doing things uh, for today. Um, uh, Julia Planitza, who has also been involved uh, content-wise in the, in the project, mm -hmm. and uh, our indispensable interns and fellows, uh, Niki Kumaduraki and uh, Patrick Harris. Uh, so thank you very much. And I think they deserve a, a round of applause. <laughs> now the topic of today, uh, I was asked to, to give some key challenges to uh, the implementation in Europe of the right to remedy. Uh, we know that operations of businesses have spread globally, uh, but the regulation of their activities has not kept pace with these developments. Although states have a number of positive obligations under human rights law, such as the investigation of human rights, abuses perpetrated by non-state actors, and the protection of people within the jurisdiction from harm caused uh, by these abuses, the remedial structures of human rights law including national courts and supranational courts, such as the European uh, Court of Human Rights, <clears throat> have struggled to provide access to justice for victims of human rights abuses uh, outside of their jurisdiction. Because one of the most critical issues is that uh, human rights abuses where companies are involved uh, primarily take place outside of the European Union, and there we have a, a big jurisdiction problems, problem. Um, the activities give, that give rise to human rights abuses are occurring at various uh, levels at large multinational uh, companies and their subsidiaries, uh, their suppliers, and those territories have often limited capacity to monitor and effectively sanctions, uh, such, sanctions such human rights abuses. For example, there is a lack of adequate resources, expertise, and support for state prosecutors to investigate. Uh, such abuses. As I mentioned, there's the issue of jurisdiction as well. As a general rule, criminal law is limited to acts done within the territory of the state, and only statutory provisions asserting extraterritorial jurisdiction will criminalize acts committed abroad. For example, the British Corporate Manslaughter and Corporate Homicide Act of 2007 paved the way for businesses to be charged with crimes but it does not apply extraterritorially. Also significant practical problems remain, such as controlling uh, the scene of the crime, gathering evidence, evidence collection, standards of evidence collection in uh, locations overseas. Member states of the European Union are subject to European legis legislation governing, governing issues of jurisdiction. Uh, the Brussels I regulation is particularly important in this regard. Under Article 2 of this regulation, the courts of EU member states are competent to adjudicate civil proceedings against companies based in the European Union for acts which have taken place outside of the European Union, even where the, the victim is not domiciled in the EU and the damage also occurred elsewhere. The definition of domicile in the regulation is also flexible in the sense that it does not rely solely on where the company's office is registered, but looks to where the central administration 
and its principal place of business is. The Brussels I regulation has been interpreted by the Court of Justice of the European Union to preclude states from applying the forum non-convenience doctrine. Under this doctrine, courts can prevent a case from moving forward in the jurisdiction in which it is filed on the basis that another jurisdiction is more convenient for the parties and witnesses, which has posed problems for applicants trying to ping the case uh, before the company's home states, for, for example, uh, to the EU member states. While the removal of forum non-convenience uh, is, is a positive development overall, the courts of EU member states can only uh, adjudicate cases against defendant companies registered and seated in an EU member state, and these nationality and territorial uh, requirements can still discourage victims uh, of corporate-related abuse to litigate in European Union countries, and thereby reducing the accessibility of these remedies. And I'm sure we will hear more uh, about that uh, in the next panel. Another issue is the so-called corporate veil. Corporate veil means that under the principle of separate corporate legal personality, a parent company is, generally speaking, not liable for the conduct, conduct of its subsidiaries, simply by virtue of being a shareholder. Litigators have attempted to circumvent the corporate veil by claiming that a company has been directly negligent for harm caused over which it had direct control, instead of alleging its responsibility for the negligence of its subsidiaries. For example, in uh, the UK courts, um, they have demonstrated a willingness to adjudicate on this issue in transnational business and human rights cases, for example, in the Lube and Ors versus Cape uh, case of 2000. Um, that, that was a case taken against an English parent company um, of a South African subsidiary which manufactured asbestos uh, products. The court, the UK court, ruled that even though South Africa was the more appropriate forum uh, of jurisdiction, the strong probability that the claimants would be unable to obtain uh, both legal representation and the expert evidence that they needed to substantiate their claims would amount to a denial of justice. This is, this is a positive development, however, quite a few barriers uh, to accessibility remain. Litigating court cases against multinational corporations can be complex, risky, resource intensive and hard fought by the companies themselves. The costs associated with gathering evidence in a foreign state, the costs of legal and technical experts, and the sheer fact that these cases can take more than a decade to litigate make them very expensive. The variety of, of human rights abuses that we see today are likely to require a variety of multilateral solutions. It is clear that for a success, successful regulation of non-state actors, there needs to be a synthesis between international standard setting, supervision and ac accountability, and a rather robust uh, national system of regulation. The main international standard on human rights and, and business, it has already been referred to today, the UN Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights attempt to address some of these issues. The guiding principles were developed by the UN Special Representative on the issue of human rights and a corporate uh, transnational corporation and other business enterprises. They're designed to implement the protect, respect, and remedy framework. Uh, that means the state duty to protect human rights, the responsibility of businesses to respect human rights, and a shared obligation of states and companies to provide access to remedies for human rights violations where they arise. So the topic of today. The guiding principles envisage the creation of a multilateral human rights due diligence framework. This framework is supposed to contain a mix of voluntary and regulatory uh, approaches and of traditional and non-traditional remedies. While effective traditional remedies lie at the core uh, of this system, the, the guiding principles also envisage the creation of non-traditional remedies on the ground to complement uh, traditional remedies. In the business and human rights context, the term grievance uh, is often used to describe 
an issue arising between a company and an individual or group of persons. And I'm now quoting the interpretation of the definition of the UN guiding principles. A grievance is understood to be a perceived injustice evoking an individual's or a group's sense of entitlement, which may be based on a law, contract, explicit or implicit promise, customary practice, or general notions of fairness of aggrieved communities. Rather than just referring to courts and tribunals, the guiding principles refer to a broader category of uh, grievance mechanisms, um, which again the principles define as any routinized state-based or non-state-based judicial or non-judicial process through which grievances concerning business-related human rights abuse can be raised and remedy can be sought. You see, it's, it's, it's a broad definition, but it, it contains also a certain vagueness and possibility. You know? Can be raised, may be sought. And this also points at, at the voluntary nature of, of this kind of, of remedies. Um, but, as we will see uh, later today, uh, non-judicial remedies have a lot of potential uh, to give access uh, for victims of human rights violations to, to get remedy. I would like to, to close with, with giving you um, a, a very short uh, introduction to the criteria that the guiding principles um, apply for in particular uh, company and operation level grievance mechanisms um, so that they can be considered as effective uh, according to the guiding principles. First, they must be legitimate. So they must have a clear, transparent and independent governance uh, structure. They must be accessible to the target group, both in terms of uh, resources, uh, information and so on. They, it must be a predictable structure. There must be a clear time frame, a clear procedure. It must be equitable so that um, the complainants have um, on, the, on a fair and equitable footing um, access and uh, follow up to the procedure. They must be rights compatible so that the, the remedies themselves and the outcome comply with international human rights standards. And, uh, and that has been a, a big issue uh, also with non-judicial grievance mechanisms, they must be transparent. It must be obvious that how the process goes, how the outcomes have come about, so that um, um, it can be, yeah, from the outset it can be seen uh, how, how the system kind of works. And a, a last principle that is maybe a little bit overlooked uh, in the current debate and I think has a lot of potential to um, both to create a good mechanism and to develop the mechanism further is uh, engagement and dialogue of, of the company in most cases. So that before establishing the mechanism, uh, consult the relevant stakeholders, uh, get their input and also um, in the implementation of, of the mechanism um, Keep, keep the dialogue going and continuously improve the <coughs> mechanism. So these are essentially the characteristics that any grievance mechanism according to uh, the guiding principles should have uh, in order to be uh, effective. And these are sort of maybe rudimentary still, but they are guidelines for companies to set up such a mechanism. Given the problems that I have outlined earlier with judicial remedies, we witness a real proliferation of non-judicial remedies to address this, this governance gap that we are facing. There are, however, important limitations to non-judicial grievance mechanisms, in particular company grievance mechanisms. Certain human rights abuses, above all uh, severe human rights violations, should not be dealt with by non-judicial mechanisms. They must go to a functioning court system. Also systemic problems that require state policy action or legislative action, such as, for example, changes in labor law, cannot be dealt with, with by non-judicial uh, mechanisms. Um, it was interesting to see in our research that uh, when we looked at a number of grievance mechanisms, such as the Fair Labor Association, which is a multi-stakeholder initiative, and the grievance mechanism of a sportswear uh, corporation, Adidas, that they were faced with 
a majority, in the majority of cases, with trade union issues, with collective labor rights, with systemic issues. And those issues can be dealt with more or less successfully on the factory level with these non-judicial grievance mechanisms, but the root causes of these problems cannot be solved. And we will hear later today what the non-judicial remedy process can or cannot deliver. So there will be a second panel on this, and also in the afternoon we will present uh, research findings on, on that. So it's a challenging and very interesting road that we are taking. The Access to Remedies project that we are thankful to be a partner of and a training today will provide some answers and will probably raise even more questions. I look forward to today and thank you very much for your interest. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'd like to extend uh, also my thanks, as we've heard this morning uh, from, from many. It takes a lot of work to put a training session together, and it can't be underestimated. And not only on behalf of the organizers, uh, the Ludwig Boltzmann Institute for Human Rights, uh, but also the sponsors today, the European Commission, Austrian Federal Ministry of Labor, Social Affairs and Consumer Protection, and the Austrian Chamber of Labor. And a very important thanks to all of you for being here. Uh, I think the fact that this room, as large as it is, is practically full, uh, is a strong testament to the interest in this topic, which is, which is really why we're here, because we want to create interest, bring attention to these issues, not only research, uh, but really disseminate. Sorry, I'll give it a moment. to the technicians <laughs> for their work. Sure. Yeah, no problem. Uh, what we're trying to do is put the project website up um, to give you a couple of resources and tips on how to continue your participation after today's training session. Uh, so my, my uh, objective now in just a few brief moments uh, is to speak to you about the Human Rights and Business Project, our goals, our work streams, and most importantly, to extend an invitation, let you know how you can get involved, how to participate uh, in the work of our project going forward. So the Human Rights and Business Project is designed to research, teach, and disseminate uh, solutions for business and human rights challenges for cross-border litigation in the European Union. The project is co-funded by the European Commission Directorate General for Justice and coordinated by the Global Governance Institute for Democratic Governance in San Sebastian, Spain. The project commenced in September 2014 and we will present our final results to the European Commission in Brussels in September 2016. Our research consortium is composed of leading academics and practitioners from across six EU member states, uh, many of whom are present today. Uh, those institutions are the University of Navarra, Frank Bold Society, the University of Castilla-La Mancha, University of Yaume Uno, University of Rovira in Vigili, Case Van Dam Consultancy, of course the Ludwig Boltzmann Institute of Human Rights, Tilburg University, Utrecht University, Leiden University, the Public University of Navarra, the Law Offices of Cuatre Casas Gonçalves Pereira, Kimep University, Humboldt University, University of Deusto, University of the Basque Country. Uh, so we have a diverse group of researchers, as you can see, and the, delivers, uh, the deliverables of this research consortium will take the form of a four-part report and a handbook for activists and victims. Uh, the report will focus in four areas, uh, jurisdiction, applicable law, corporate obligations, and the topic of today, uh, non-judicial mechanisms. Uh, alongside our research, we have two other main work streams, training uh, and dissemination of our results to a wide, array, uh, a, a wide array of stakeholders. Uh, since the commencement of this project, we've held two previous training sessions, uh, the first in San Sebastian, Spain in February 2015, and the second in Tilburg, in the Netherlands, uh, earlier this year in June 2015. So thank you for being part of our third training session uh, here in Vienna. So I don't think we'll be able to connect. Uh, uh, well, I'll explain, walk you through it uh, anyhow. We might be able to put up 
uh, the image, but effectively you can follow our results so far uh, at our website, www.humanrightsinbusiness.eu. Uh, there you'll have podcasts, videos of our previous training sessions, uh, publications from our research consortium and other relevant publications. Uh, the idea is for you to be able to read, watch, listen, uh, and participate through that site. Uh, moreover, uh, there is a section to participate. We've posted certain questionnaires uh, that you are each individually invited uh, to submit your uh, ideas and, and feedback into uh, that can make our way in, into our results and into our uh, reports. Uh, so you are, uh, as mentioned, uh, asked to share your ideas, uh, your experience, uh, if, we'll, if it's up. If not, it's all right. There's a section. Uh, clearly Mark participate. It's a place for you to also in a free-form way uh, leave any thoughts and feedback after today's training session or any thoughts that you have throughout the duration of uh, the implementation of our project. Uh, for updates, uh, you can also follow us uh, through social media. We have a Twitter account. So today, uh, actually we've already began uh, some uh, uh, feedback on Twitter at humanbusinesseu, uh, EU, sorry, uh, with the hashtag uh, human business EU. So today, if you want to leave your impressions as well, it'd be a place to do so. And if you follow through uh, from the home page, uh, this is a place where you can participate, where I mentioned earlier. Will it come up? Oh, oops. We might have a, 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 a slower connection. Um, Effectively, what you'd see here is a list of the videos, the podcasts, uh, the reading material, and spaces for feedback. I uh, just wanted to effectively introduce you to the site, uh, and hopefully, after today's interest and involvement in this topic, uh, you'll be inspired to let us know your thoughts, share your feedback, and, and get involved. Thank you very much, and look forward to today. <laughs>